martyred by someone else's blood. During the election count from May 7th to May 10th, there were daily civic crusade demonstrations organized and spurred on by John Maisto and the American embassy. It was evident that they intended to instigate an uprising, but the masses never joined them. So they decided they would do it alone. It was a sacrifice for the wealthy. The demonstrations were conducted during business hours. Nine to five protests in the banking district centered around Calle 50. They never took place far from there and were always programmed at predetermined times of day. The Rabi Blancos were encouraging their employees to hit the streets for an instant rally in front of the TV cameras. There was a distorted notion that Panama was close to revolution. All eyes focused on Calle 50, where the protesters arrived in their Mercedes and their perfume-soaked women waved starched white handkerchiefs. Instead of going to play tennis or find a game of poker at the Union Club, they would drive down to Calle 50 for a few hours of protest. And when they got hot and tired in the evening heat, they could always send down their maids to do the protesting for them, carrying along their Teflon-coated pots and pans to bang a phony protest rhythm. It didn't sound like the fire-hardened, blackened iron pots of San Miguelito or of the poor neighborhoods. There were no protests there. The rest of the country was actually peaceful and quiet. The poor people of Chorijo, San Miguelito, Caledonia, and everywhere else in Panama, people who couldn't afford a day off, went to work, went to the movies, bought their lottery tickets, went out dancing, and went to sleep, living life as they always did. Was it because the people were repressed in those areas by the demons, me, and the Panamanian Defense Forces? Or was it because they had no reason to protest? that the protests were manufactured by white bankers and businessmen in collusion with the Americans. The demonstrators became increasingly active. The first few times, they agreed to march in the street, but only after much prodding by Maisto and company by the U.S. Embassy. And they met with such little success that we thought each attempt would fizzle and be their last. We were wrong. They set up one last desperate march on Wednesday, May 10th, again organized and forced upon the opposition by the Americans. With very few supporters on the streets, Guillermo Andara, Ricardo Arias Calderón, and Billy Ford, the other vice presidential candidate, fearful of taking a stand, having little prospect of success, hopped into their van and began a small motorcade down to Casco Viejo, the old part of downtown Panama City. All along the route, they were in touch with their American embassy benefactors via mobile radio. The reluctant procession rolled downtown along Avenida Central toward Casco Viejo, where international TV cameras were waiting. The Americans were pushing their gutless Panamanian stooges to the limit because they intended to create a scene. The provocation came in the form of a human life. It happened that the U.S. Embassy had lent bodyguard Alexis Guerra to work with the opposition candidates. Guerra was an employee of a company called Tesna Mimsa, a security firm whose sole contract was with the U.S. Embassy. Guerra was considered a traitor by those who knew him in the military and the police force. He had sided with the enemy and was on loan to the opposition candidates, working this day to protect Billy Ford. The atmosphere was volatile as the caravan reached the end of the road, down to the waterfront at Santa Ana Park. The police were under orders not to shoot, to avoid being provoked into action. These were standing orders. But shots were fired, and regardless of how and why, the responsibility was ours. The officer in charge had failed by not controlling the situation. The incident could have been provoked by the march participants or by agents planted in the crowd or among the troops, and it could have been PDF soldiers who had been bought off. The Americans employed agents provocateurs on the streets to stir up trouble. Many of them were Puerto Ricans, members of the U.S. military in civilian clothes. For example, an American army colonel, Chico Stone, went frequently to such events as a civilian, wearing his baseball cap and blue jeans. Stone was expelled from the country for attending civilian rallies. We arrested some of the Puerto Ricans at one rally, camouflaged as if they were Panamanians. That was how they worked. When it was over, Guerra was dead. His blood splattered all over the sparkling white guayabera of Billy Ford. Was Guerra the target? Was it intentional? It was part of John Maisto's plan. It is an understatement to say that this did us no good. I knew that the world reaction would be devastating, but there was nothing I could do about it. Bad as it was, it was even worse because we had redoubled our efforts to avoid the constant provocation hurled at us by the Americans. 
Common sense dictates that if you are counting election ballots and have hopes that your side can win, you should not simultaneously be out on the street beating up the other side's presidential and vice presidential contenders. This would be the very thing that the opposition would want us to do in order to pull victory from almost certain defeat. And the bloodletting that day took the process over the edge. The reality was that a bloody photo of Billy Ford transmitted around the world was a product of a plan to create a victim. The Americans saw it as good fortune that Ford would have his clothing stained with blood to make it seem as if he had been injured and was the victim of violence. He did nothing to correct the impression. He was a martyr with someone else's blood. One week after the balloting, the civic crusade tried a Sunday general strike. It didn't work. They had no support. The Americans saw that their plans had been stymied, and Dada, who said he had been lightly injured in the fracas at Casco Viejo, was left to his own devices. Comically, the rotund lawyer announced a hunger strike, saying he would eat nothing except for the host when he went to Mass. The joke went around that he was praying all the time so he could take as much communion as possible, because nobody noticed any change in his sizable frame. Other than that, we had burst the balloon, and Panama quieted down. There was no civil strife in the country. Our main problem was the escalating military provocation from the Americans, and the escalation had hardly begun.